A very good afternoon to all of you. This Asia Future Summit today will be is actually organized by the three newspapers on their ass. And the theme is because it's the birth centenary of Singapore's founding Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew. We know that Lee Kuan Yew did not want to be worshipped, and therefore this morning, even Ambassador Chan Heng Chi also said that we are not here to talk about Lee Kuan Yew's thoughts. But indeed, Lee Kuan Yew did put Singapore onto the global stage. He helped Singapore find our own position, and in so doing, he considered the overall positioning of Singapore. He was also very concerned about urban development. He was also very conscientious about all these details. My name is Li Huiling, and I'm very, very pleased to be here today to be able to share with So today we will be uh, using this theme of revisiting LKY's view of the world today. And we are very pleased to be able to invite these three important guests here on stage because these three guests have had very close uh, interaction with Lee Kuan Yew during his, his lifetime and to share with us about the views ahead. First of all, we will invite Mr. Heng Sui Kit, who is the Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for Economic Policies of Singapore. Mr. Heng, from 1997 to 2000, was actually the personal secretary, first secretary to Lee Kuan Yew. And Lee Kuan Yew once mentioned that Heng Sui Kit, Mr. Heng Sui Kit, was his best secretary. Now, Mr. Heng Sui Kit, before he entered politics, was also the leader of the uh, the chairman of the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and he was also Education Minister. So perhaps we can invite Mr. Heng to be able to speak first. You have about 10 minutes to speak. Thank you very much. A very warm welcome to everyone to Singapore, to this Asia Future Summit. Now, Lee Kuan Yew's views his view of the world was actually shaped by his own personal experience because in the 1950s, Singapore experienced a lot of tumultuous occasions and Mr. Lee and his team were very determined and committed to being decolonized so that we could be independent, allowing Singaporeans to have the right to shape our own future. During the Cold War, Against such a backdrop, the communist as well as capitalist views uh, were pulling us apart. And then Singapore was in a very precarious position because we had no natural resources. We were a very small island state. Our population was very diverse. There were Raisha riots in Singapore, and there was a very high unemployment rate in Singapore. How do we ensure that Singapore could ensure that our people could have a better living in the future? Therefore, domestically, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and his team were very determined that they had to build a multiracial country, a multi-religious and equal society, a very just society. And externally, they have to work very hard to ensure that Singapore must be very relevant to the world. We must have our own utility in the world. So Mr. Lee Kuan Yew then was actually one of, was actually our chief foreign diplomat. And he was, uh, he, he worked very hard to build linkages with the outside world as well as framework with the outside world. So how do we look at Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's contribution to the world and the region? Perhaps we can use three different examples to look at this first to Asia's prosperity. He has done a lot of contribution. He has pointed the path ahead for us to be able to seek prosperity because Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was very bold in his actions and his approach. Then the South-South cooperation based it, his thinking were very much in contrary to the South South kind of uh, philosophy at that time. And he invited the Japanese companies, US companies, the Western companies to come to Singapore to build a world class business environment and operating environment for them. At the same time, 
He also invested a lot in the education of Singapore to push Singapore towards an export-oriented industrialization mode of development, allowing us to have better jobs here in Singapore to improve the life and quality of life here in Singapore. Singapore and Hong Kong, Taiwan and South Korea were then known as the Tigers of Asia. And with market principles and pragmatic economic fundamentals, this allowed China's opening up later on, reform and opening up, to be very uh, a useful model for Mr. Deng Xiaoping later on. And this was a model for China later on, a reference model. In 1978, Mr. Deng Xiaoping visited Singapore. In the 1980s, Mr. Go King Sui became a special consultant to one of the provinces in China in 1995. Singapore and China then embarked upon our first Suzhou Industrial Park. In 2001, which was six years later, China then entered the WTO and embarked upon a new phase of growth and prosperity. In terms of job politics, we managed to embark upon more cooperation and understanding of each other because Mr. Lee understood that the large powers would have a mind of their own as well as their influence and impact on the smaller countries. So he espoused a longer strategic view for Singapore's interests as well as the regional interests. To, for U.S., he has also built very close linkages and personal relationship with the various U.S. presidents, including uh, Nixon, uh, George Bush Sr., and so on. At the same time, he also placed a lot of emphasis on relationships with China. When he visited, actually, he has been to China. China for 33 times he's interacted with Mao Zedong, with Deng Xiaoping, Xi Jinping. So he has been in personal interaction with many of these leaders of China as well as the leaders of the various provinces in China. He had a very good understanding, therefore, of what things of China itself. And with all these relationships that he has built over the years between the leaders and himself, especially between U.S. and China, he allowed them to better be able to understand each other, to understand each other's interest, and be able to convert them into strategic visions as well as common interest as well as to help to ease the short-term conflicts between them. In 1999, there was a U.S. jet that destroyed the Chinese embassy in Yugoslavia. Then, in 1999, we were holding a special meeting in Shangri-La. And the State of Secretary Madeleine Albright of U.S. as well as Teng Jiaxuan from China both visited Singapore then, and we they, they met. Perhaps we can share a little about some of the conversations they had then. So in 1993, also in Singapore, we have the Wangku meeting between Taiwan and China, and. Next is to build a framework that is a multilateral framework that is based upon rules. Because Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was a very pragmatic about geopolitics, he wanted a very tolerant, inclusive framework. And ASEAN, he worked very hard to improve the relationship and co cooperation between countries, uh, also among the ASEAN countries. And also there was the summit as well as other platforms to be able to link ASEAN with the other external powers. Among the larger powers, he also wanted to improve the cooperation between them and also allow them to better understand each other. Singaporeans continue to be diligent in trying to make our own contribution. For example, in 1982, the United States UNCLOS, as well as the recent BNJPP, which is Biodiversity and Maritime, 
as well as the uh, Forum of Small States was also started by Singapore. In 1996, there were only 16 countries, but today we have 108 countries inside the Forum of Small States. Therefore, inside this Forum of Small States, we have organized many meetings between the small states of the world. And this has helped to lead a path forward for Asia's development and prosperity, allowing our countries to work together to cooperate with the external powers in an order that is based on rules, a multilateral framework that is based on rules. This is Lee Kuan Yew's contribution to this area's development as well as to the world's development. And I think that these are still very practical today and they are still in use today. Although global politics as well as the tone have changed today, we can still tap on the experience of Lee Kuan Yew himself to be very pragmatic and utilitarian uh, in our vision to understand that domestically politics may be very hard to control and manage, but we need nevertheless to continuously cast our eyes abroad and to a longer distance into the future. We need to find common values as well as room for us to be able to better manage the common challenges. All countries, be they big or small, must continue to do this, to move forward, to improve our people's way of living, quality of life, as well as the peace in the world. If Mr. Lee Kuan Yew were able to see that the big countries could play a more constructive role as well as more coordinated, harmonious leadership role in dealing with the larger issues of the world, I think he would be very pleased. Thank you, DPM. Um, John Howard. Um, Mr. John Howard served as the Australian um, Prime Minister between March 1996 and November 2007. Um, he's the second longest um, uh, serving prime minister in Australia. And um, when Mr. Howard became prime minister of Australia, Mr. Lee was then um, senior minister and subsequently minister mentor. But um, you met several times with him. The last, I re uh, um, the last public meeting that you had um, I looked into my archives was in 2007 Australia um, and guess what they were talking about then climate change <laughs> <laughs> still talking about it <laughs> yeah so Mr. Howard can you please well, well, can I start by saying I'm delighted to be here in Singapore again Singapore was the first country I visited as a travelling Australian. And I arrived in Singapore on the 29th of July, 1964. <laughs> and at that particular time, there was a curfew in force because there had been some race riots. And of course, Singapore was going through a very difficult time. And ultimately, of course, Malaysia was formed. And then, as you all know, Singapore was effectively pushed out of Malaysia and had to go on its own and did an amazing job. And it was due in no small measure to the amazing leadership of Lee Kuan Yew. When I think of him, I think of somebody who understood that to achieve his goal of holding his nation together, building its prosperity, and expanding the standard of living opportunities for its population, he had to combine a lot of beliefs and attitudes. Mm -hmm. What struck me about him was that he, very early in his political career, built a very close association as a lawyer with the trade union movement. Yes. Yet he was <laughs> an absolutely unbridled capitalist. He believed very strongly that competitive capitalism was the driving force. And when you think of what has happened over the last few years and how hundreds of millions of people 
have been lifted out of poverty in the last generation or two. It's been due very largely to the globalised forces of competitive capitalism. Lee Kuan Yew was very much a citizen of the world. He related to his region, but he didn't see the ultimate destiny of Singapore just being in the region, important though it was. He developed very close relations with European leaders. He preserved the best of his associations with the British, obviously. He'd been a very successful, articulate and widely acclaimed campaigner for independence. But when the modern Singapore was founded, the rule of law was at the heart of it, a highly professionalised public service was there and the appropriate and adequate remuneration of members of parliament was also there. And these were things that um, had been there during the British colonial period and he picked the best whilst rejecting those that were no longer fit for purpose. And of course, he understood the great power forces. I remember towards the end of the American involvement in the Vietnam War, which by then had become very unpopular, not only in America, but also internationally, Lee Kuan Yew was outspoken in his support. He said that America's involvement in Vietnam had bought time for countries such as Singapore. It had helped to prevent a communist takeover in Indonesia. In other words, he understood the geostrategic currents and the various pressures in our region. He was, um, as uh, the previous speaker, Mr Heng, has pointed out, he was very close to American presidents on both sides of the aisle. He understood the continued importance of um, America in the region. And he understood in a, not only in a, perhaps detached is the wrong word, but in a reflective way, he understood why people behaved as they did. I recall calling to see him when I was treasurer, that's finance minister in your language, in a former coalition government in Australia. And it was about the time that the Thatcher government had decided to send an armada to the South Atlantic. And I recall him saying, isn't that extraordinary? How absolutely audacious uh, of the lady to do that. He was, whatever his views may have been, he was able to detach himself but, and, and, and see it in a broader context. He knew that to survive and prosper, Singapore had to become very much as a nation, a citizen of the world. It certainly preserved many of its traditional ways, but it embraced new ones. The decision to embrace in a, in a formal sense the English language uh, coupled with the various uh, communal languages which were so evident here in Singapore was a very sensible approach. He developed a great capacity to speak his mind without giving offence. I remember on one occasion uh, in the 1980s there was a debate raging in Australia about our economic growth and development, about whether we were working hard enough, whether there was enough productivity and he said, if it's, in effect, he said, if Australia does not lift her game, she runs the risk of becoming the poor white trash of Asia. <laughs> that was fairly blunt, <laughs> fairly direct, but most people knew exactly what he was saying, why he said it, and no sensible person in Australia took any offence. And um, I think it's fair to note that productivity then did begin to pick up a bit now, whether Lee Kuan Yew played a role in that. <laughs> and another occasion I remember, and it was a debate that was developing in Australia in the 1990s about whether 
uh, we should cut our ties with the British monarchy and become a republic. And I was on the side that was against it. I was in favour of keeping the ties with the monarchy. I still am. And uh, he made a very direct comment about the debate when he was addressing the National Pred Club. He said some people are running around and saying that if Australia cut her ties with the monarchy, she would relate better to the nations of Asia. He said, that's nonsense. He said, I don't think it would make any difference at all. He said, it's how you treat us, how you relate to us, whether you regard us as equals that really matters. Mm -hmm. And so he became somebody who was increasingly revered uh, as uh, uh, an achiever, who realised a dream in, in impossible circumstances, I mean, the sense of despair that must have been felt in 1965 when Singapore was pushed out of Malaysia. Mm -hmm. It was difficult, but he didn't bear grudges. He remembered, but he didn't bear grudges and he was always fixed very much on the future. And uh, I admired him. We didn't always agree on Naturally, he was, uh, in the early years, he was a critic of the white Australia policy, but of course, by the time I became Prime Minister, that policy had long since been abandoned by Harold Holt uh, as the leader of a Liberal government in the late 1960s. So, I am honoured to be part of this gathering. I liked him, I respected him. He was a strong leader, he was an effective leader and he's given you, his country, men and women, uh, a wonderful future and a wonderful sense of purpose and direction. Thank you. Thank you. Let us now invite Mr. Ma ying former president of Taiwan, to speak. In 2008 to 2016, he was in politics for uh, quite a few years, and he was also the chairman and founder of the Mainji Mainju Foundation. And so he has also brought many very young, bright talents from Taiwan here to give them a better understanding of the world. In 2015, Mr. Mainju. When Mr. Lee Kuan Yew passed away, Mr. Ma ying then said that uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and Jiang Jingguo had very close interactions. They often had these male correspondence, very regular male correspondences between. And Ma ying then was actually the personal secretary to Mr. Uh, Jiang Jingguo. And he also helped Mr. Jiang Jingguo write some of these letters or replies to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. And therefore, he better understood the kind of relationship, very close relationship between Mr. Jiang, uh, Jiang Jingguo as well as Lee Kuan Yew. And when Mr. Lee Kuan Yew passed away, Mr. Ma ying also came to Singapore to attend the wake. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Heng Sui Kit, Mr. John Howard. Moderator, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, a very good afternoon to everyone. I'm very honored to be here to attend the Asia Future Summit here in Singapore to be able to look back at Lee Kuan Yew's view of the world as well as contribution to the development of the world. First of all, I'd like to share that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew has got very close relationships with Taiwan. During his lifetime, he's visited Taiwan 25 times. It's perhaps the most among leaders in the world. In the early years, we helped Singapore to build the army, and through the Singguang plan, the sunlight uh, plan, we have had more than 50 years of cooperation allowing Singapore and Taiwan to be able to build very close relationship between us. Here I'd like to share my personal story. About a few decades ago, there were a group of young Singaporeans who visited Taiwan for travel. 
in the evening they got lost in Taiwan in the rural countryside area. That time we didn't have handphones, so there was no GPS. They had to use a map. And under one of the street lights in front of a homestay, they looked at the map. And that homestay, uh, the owner of the homestay suddenly opened the door and invited them to go in to rest in the inn. And not only that, showed hospitality, but invited them to have drinks. And then the male owner of that homestay said, hey, this is not early, I need to rest, but you can continue to stay in my living room. And then when you leave, remember to switch off the lights and lock the door after you. And this group of young Singaporeans were astounded. They thought that, my gosh, Singap this, this Taiwanese, they are so, they, they must really believe in Singaporeans. They are too kind, really. I myself, in 1984, in 1987, uh, I was the minister of Taiwan, and I also visited Singapore. I also encountered something interesting myself because I have this habit of doing morning jogs, and even when I'm overseas. And then when I was in Singapore, there were two Singapore bodyguards that were sent with me, but I actually outran them. I outran the two police guards from Singapore, and even the police guards from Singapore couldn't keep up with me. Then the next day, the Singapore government invited a, a, um, one of the athletic runner to go and jog with me. And this time round, I was not able to keep up with the athletic jogger. So you see, the Singapore government is very serious and studious in everything that it does. And I think that with Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, with Mr. Lee Hsien Loong, I have had very close relationship with both generations, and be it in personal life or in my public life, they have given me a lot of inspiration and advice. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was very concerned about the cross strait relations and was very, very keen to have peaceful development, especially in 1994, the Ku Wang, the meeting was held here in Singapore. And this allowed us, this was a historic milestone in our relationship. Since then, I personally got a keen sense of how Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was very close. He had this strong sense of mission to push forth a relationship for the Taiwan Straits because he felt that this was very, very crucial to the peace and stability of Asian region. And then in 2002, then at the Asia Forum, I, together with Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, who was a senior minister, I spoke to him. And we both reached a consensus that the cross straits development must focus on the welfare of its people. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's views resonated deeply with me. And later on, when I was a president of Taiwan, I also used this as a guiding principle in our cross straits relationships development. No matter what we do, it must consider the welfare of our people. So here I'm also very grateful and I'd like to express my thanks to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew for his open recognition to me on a few occasions. In, during the, an, an, an APEC summit, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, who was a senior minister at that time, um, answered some questions and said that Mr. Ma Ying Zhou, President Ma Ying Zhou, has carried out some measures to ease the tension on the cross straits relations and use very open uh, to open measures. And this is the right way to do. If this were to continue, then Taiwan would have a lot of growth, potential for growth. And then later on, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, when he last visited Taiwan, he also gave recognition to my policies and my contribution to the Taiwan Straits. Indeed, for the eight years when I was president, looking back, this period was actually the most peaceful between, you know, the in, along the Taiwan Straits, it was definitely not the most dangerous place as later on described by the economist. Later on, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, in his one man's view of the world in his later book, he also pointed me uh, put, uh, and he, he raised my name and pointed out that it gave recognition to the things I've done. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew felt that Taiwan should it declare independence, then mainland China would use military to interfere with that. And U.S. will not then engage with the Chinese militarily. I have a lot of 
respect for his wisdom. And on the Taiwan Straits, we've often said that we cannot use external powers to interfere and help us solve our problems. We cannot allow other powers and other peoples of other powers to come and sacrifice their lives for us. So for US that has long given long-term support to us, we also don't want them to be embroiled in another Ukraine war. We hope that foreign governments, if they really want to see a stable development in a cross straits relations, then the best way is to encourage both sides to have constructive discussions so that we can avoid a, dis a conflict across the straits. As the Sun Tzu out of war would say, we should try to avoid war. Uh, the, the, the last resort is to go to war. So we should use peaceful development as our main cause towards stability. A war is most to us, is something that we must avoid at all costs because it can cause a lot of tremendous loss of lives as well as other losses from 20. 2008 to 2016, when I was president, we had very stable relationship with mainland China, and we both signed the 23 agreements covering all aspects of our people's lives, including the economic cooperation framework (EFA) between the two sides. To date, you know, President Tsai Ing-wen continues to use this as a foundation a core of their economic growth. This, The reason why I could achieve all this was because during my tenure as president, during the eight years, both sides agreed that we must continue to mutually respect each other, to continuously correspond with each other, interact with each other in the hopes that our people can improve. Because after the DPP became president, they, weren't, uh, they did not recognize the consensus, 1992 consensus. In fact, the President Tsai Ing-wen two years ago raised that the ROC and the PRC are uh, uh, not subjugated to each other. In other words, both sides have uh, independent streaks. In fact, all the eight years of hard work I've done in the past have completely gone to waste as a result. And later on, Tsai Ing-wen, President Tsai Ing-wen even said Taiwan National Day. This truly is moving towards Taiwan independence, which is why this year I refuse to attend this National Day parade because I reject Taiwan independence. In order to have prosperity and peace, both sides yearn for that. And in order to that, 1992 consensus is the key principle we must go back to the 1992 consensus, this common consensus that we both have, and then embark upon constructive discussion between us. Only then can we have a mutually beneficial relationship. For many years, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's wisdom, as well as his insights, have enabled me to benefit a lot. I am very grateful to him. In 2015, when Mr. Lee Kuan Yew passed away, I took a flight to Singapore at the wake to attend the wake and I wrote in his book in both Chinese and English that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew has allowed Singapore to become a first rate country in the world. He has also made enormous contributions to the development along the cross straits relations and that is a lot of contribution. He was clean, he was determined, he was diligent, he loved his people, he was also very wise towards the relationships between Taiwan as well as mainland China. I think we should really pay attention to what he has, the wisdom that he has espoused. So last of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for your invitation for me to come here to share with everyone my gratitude towards Mr. Lee Kuan Yew as well as the kind of inspiration he has given me on the Taiwan Strait relations. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know a lot of people are willing to ask questions, but before they do that, I would like to ask a question. If uh, the three of you can answer, uh, please do so. So.
And it was mentioned just now that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, uh, Mr. John Howard mentioned just now, he was a very direct person. He was very frank, not only to Australia, but in fact, in many different occasions, he was very, that was his feature, the Lee Kuan Yew feature, uh, whether uh, or even to um, China. He was very direct and very frank, especially during the 1980s when he went to China uh, many times. And at that time, even the Chinese leaders also know that that was his style. And the Chinese media even described Li Kuan Yew as he was, he was uh, the critical friend. Especially, uh, Mr. Heng, you were his pri principal China uh, private secretary, and that you have observed how he interacted with the Chinese leaders, and even also saw how he interacted with the American leaders. How could they accept the way you know the way his the way his critics and the, the way he was, you know, a critical friend, and in the current world now. Uh, do people accept this type of critical friends, you know, given the current diplomatic environment in the world? The most difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> but let, let, me, let, let me take a step. I'm sure, you know, John and Ma, Mr. Ma would uh, have uh, their, their viewpoints. Uh, I, I would say that first, the, the reason why Mr. Lee's views have been so well uh, regarded is that he really speaks his mind and he has a very strategic worldview. He's not looking at just the immediate concerns and immediate issues, but what is in each country's long-term interest, number one. And number two, how in the pursuit of this long-term interest, countries can also find a common space to work together. In other words, how can both parties achieve their long-term interest? And which is why uh, he is always very concerned when people react to short-term political pressure, short-term political issues. Sometimes, you know, you, you react in a certain way and you get brownie points from, the, from your electorate, but that is not how he feels that a country should be governed in a, in a, long, in a long run, because at the end of it, it's the results that matter, whether you achieve a better life for the people. So in that regard, um, he, he is very clear-minded about why certain things need to be done. And in many of the places that I've went with him, you find that people who are very immersed in the situation do not quite, uh, you know, you're so immersed in the situation, sometimes you lose the objectivity. And Mr. Lee is a very good objective third-party uh, observer with a very, very clear mind, and he said, well, actually, the long-term interest of you, this country or this place, uh, should be this, and the long-term interest uh, would be in that direction. And I think there's also a lot of trust that he's not saying it to uh, please anybody. He's saying it with a view to finding a solution that is of value to, to both parties. And I think that's why his views have been very well uh, uh, regarded. Um, you know, one specific example I, I could think of is, you know, when I, I mentioned earlier in my, uh, in my speech that in 1999, when the American uh, fighter plane dropped a bomb on the uh, Chinese embassy in Belgrade, it was quite a ruckus. And at that time, in 1999, the Shangri-La Dialogue was held. In, there was a Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore. And both uh, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Tang Jiaxuan asked to meet Mr. Lee. And what I, I, I sat in on both meetings, and what I found most interesting is that had the two parties exchanged notes, they would have, came, they would have found that what Mr. Lee said to each of them were the same, but from a very different perspective. 
why is it in uh, America's, why America should adopt that position and why the Chinese should adopt that position. In fact, specifically in 1999, the Chinese were seeking to enter the WTO. They were in a very intense stage of negotiation with America on entry into the WTO. And uh, Mr. Lee's advice to uh, Foreign Minister Tang was, was that, look, the longer term interest of China must be to enter the WTO and continue to support this reform and opening up, support the development of the Chinese economy. And that is the big change uh, for, for China. Now, if you fritter your resources and start fighting over this particular incident, you are going to be on the wrong path and accept the American explanation that it was accidental and you manage to calm your domestic population and that's how you can make progress. And to uh, Secretary Albright, his point was, look, is it better for China in the longer term to be a member of the WTO, to be a member of a multilateral system where the multilateral rules uh, apply to <coughs> countries big and small and be part of it? Is it better for China to continue with development or for China to uh, seek its own space and, uh, because it will need to develop it, and it is not something that countries can just uh, seek to stop because you'll find other ways and then you end up making an enemy of China. So I think how we coexist, but with a very long-term interest. So what was remarkable, I think, is that he is able to, he has a clear view of what the solution should be in, in handling this uh, relationship. And in that particular moment, how do you resist taking short-term measures that which may be very popular with, with the people, but which may actually harm each country's long-term interests. So by taking that strategic view uh, of the country's long-term interests and how countries can work together, I think he was very persuasive to both parties. Yeah. I remember one of the party was uh, when I brought them, uh, sent them down in the lift, one of them said, I want the notes of this meeting verbatim. You know, that, what he said make a lot of sense. <laughs> so I think that that would be my take on why he has been so well uh, accepted, even though he never means his words. Would anyone want to add? Well, in my several occasions in talking to him, I feel that he's very honest and straightforward. In Chinese, we should say, 实话实说, this is why we like him. I think I get best um, assess it by saying this, that he knew for a long time that survival, let alone success for Singapore, was not guaranteed. So the, the margin was quite tiny for a long time. And that meant that he was totally focused on doing the right thing in relation to every issue. Yeah. Did he get every call right? No, of course he didn't. But in the long run, uh, by focusing on what had to be done to maintain um, survival and then survival to um, consolidation and then mm. improvement, turning into success was the result of his application. But I think it's very important to understand that <clears throat> for a long time it was at the margin and, and we'd be deluding ourselves if we didn't recognise that and it makes the achievement uh, of Lee Kuan Yew and also helps to explain the application of Lee Kuan Yew to the challenges he faced. Uh, better for us to understand. Okay, I shall open it to the floor. Could you please identify yourself before you ask the question? Mm. No questions? <laughs> yes. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Danny Kwa. I'm Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, thank you, panel, for such a wonderful uh, set of presentations. My question builds on what DPM Heng tells us about the Belgrade incident, where the calculation that Lee Kuan Yew presented to both sides hinged on the right uh, weighting of short-term um, short gains and longer-term advances in well-being. And my question to the panel is, where do you think this balance between short-term and long-term now sits in U.S.-China relations, and how would that thinking help us get through this difficult period? Thank you. Well, I'll have a go at that and say this, that I feel very, very strongly that all of our diplomatic efforts, whether they're from the United States, from People's Republic of China, and, and from other countries, including Singapore and Australia, should be directed towards keeping the temperature of relations between mainland China and the United States as low as possible. I thought um, the visit to Taiwan by the former Speaker of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, was very ill-advised. And I hope that we don't see any more of that. We have been able, as um, a group of countries and as a world, to keep a tenuous but nonetheless enduring peace for 70 odd years. Now, there must be some wisdom involved in that. And it's a pretty foolish group of world leaders who would say, let's put that at risk by trying something else. I think we should continue to try what we have done. And uh, I expressed a view earlier that um, um, we should analyse the impact um, on great power relations of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, you may say, what's that got to do with Taiwan? It's got a lot to do, in my view, because um, I think probably in the minds of the rulers of China, they're a little surprised that Russia didn't just roll over um, Ukraine uh, mm. with great ease. And I think uh, those who are putting together um, Chinese policy would be thinking, well, uh, maybe uh, the best thing we can do is to maintain uh, a peace tenuous, though it may be. In the long run, uh, there's a lot of ambiguity in that communique that was issued in Shanghai all those years ago. Let it remain ambiguous. Let it be interpreted in one fashion by the Chinese, let it be interpreted in another fashion by the Taiwanese, by the Americans, by the Singaporeans. The important thing is to maintain the peace and to understand that um, uh, there's not a lot of gain. In fact, there's been some horrendous loss in the military conflict that's broken out. And whilst, as I repeat, you can't directly parallel what's happened in the Ukraine with what might or might not happen in relation to Taiwan, you can uh, keep in mind the fact that keeping an ambiguous peace without any clear defining lines as to the ultimate outcome is infinitely better than the alternative. Well, I would agree with all that uh, Mr. Howard has said. I would just add uh, two things. One is that I, I think the, the, the world needs to realise that we are at a very, very uh, tense and uh, dangerous moment. And in fact, uh, I, uh, you know, Professor Graham Allison at the Harvard uh, University has written a very interesting book called Destined for War. And his... Uh, he has studied World War I, World War II, and even way back to the war between Sparta and Athens. And that conflict can happen. And his study showed that nobody 
including the antagonist or the one who started the war, ever wanted a war to happen. And it is some accidents that will happen along the way, which then trigger a whole set of uh, responses. So I think it's very important, first and foremost, for us to pay attention and for academics like yourself and other thought leaders to warn about the consequences of this because I think this, is, uh, this will set humanity back for a long time because you are now having two uh, superpowers with nuclear technology and uh, if we cannot come to some agreement, some uh, restraint, it, will, it can be a very dangerous uh, situation. And second, when I look at some of these conflicts which have started, quite a lot of it originated in the economic adjustments. And economic adjustments are very, very difficult to make, especially for uh, many, many countries. Even in a tiny economy like Singapore, we have been trying very hard in the last seven, eight years to do a transformation of the economy. Because globalization will bring enormous pressure on all our workers. But there is a major change that's going on in the global economy, which, which I think we are not paying enough attention to, which is the progress of science and technology. And in fact, the recent uh, interest over chat, GTP and the future of AI and so on, is catalyzing a lot of discussion about the future of jobs and future of skills. And, and even people talking about maybe we should have a universal basic income, maybe we don't have to work anymore and so on. But it is, it is an indication of the extent of the disruption to people's life. And globalization has benefited the huge parts of the American population. Uh, you, know, you get far cheaper goods and services from Walmart to a whole range of uh, others. But the ones who are affected by globalization, who are negatively impacted, will find it, um, will find it difficult to cope. And also the world is going through a very major period of significant demographic changes. The developed world, the, the part of the world that has developed fastest, the faster than all the others, are finding that the population is declining and aging. And that puts enormous pressure on, on every uh, country. So the tendency to keep out globalization, to see you, what was an erstwhile trading partner as now an enemy of your jobs, an enemy of the country, is a very uh, appealing one, but also a very misguided and dangerous one. So it's important for all of us who, you know, to help our people cope with these changes and at the same time help people to understand this major structural forces that are changing the global economy and in turn affecting lives and livelihoods everywhere. Uh, does this question have any direct relation to me? If you have not anything to add on, then we'll just move on. Understand the long-term implications, but I think a lot of the governments, they are facing uh, um, the voters yes. who looked at the short term. So the, I think the question was actually on, uh, on um, this. How, how would, um, I wouldn't say to balance it, but the, the reality is that we are facing a lot of people making short-term decisions mm -hmm. while I think, I mean, I read a lot of what MM, um, Mr. Lee said. It's all about long-term view that um, he, he took. Yes. yes. So yes. it's quite difficult in reality, actually, for now. Yes. yes. Sorry. Well, if you think the, the relationship between the United States and mainland China is very closely related to Taiwan, so my suggestion is actually said in my remarks yes. that the United States and other Western countries should encourage Taiwan to have dialogue with the Chinese mainland in trying to solve the problem peacefully. Mm. Thank you. More questions behind? Point. Help. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I'm Asad Latif from the Straits Times. 
This is a question for um, Mr. Howard. Uh, Mr. Howard, you could are you, associated could, with... Could you speak up? Uh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Howard, you are associated with the Howard Doctrine and one particular part of it which says that Australia should act as the Deputy Sheriff of the United States in this region. <clears throat> has, how has your thinking evolved along these lines or do you still firmly believe that Australia is the Deputy Sheriff of the United States in the Indo-Pacific? Thank you. Well, I never said we were a deputy sheriff. We weren't, and um, I don't think there's any more I can say. Australia was its own actor on everything we did. We worked closely with the United States. We didn't always agree, but we agreed most of the time. It was <clears throat> a journalistic catchphrase injected at the tail end of an interview by a journalist who I liked a lot, who's now deceased. And um, I suppose it's a good example of uh, not having hammered hard enough at the time uh, to point out that I'd never actually said it. But there you go, that happens um, sometimes. I mean, journos are part of the system and you have to love them even when they make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> We have a room full of journalists here, so they all love you. Oh, I don't believe any of them have made any mistakes. <laughs> now, that's all I've got to say. There's nothing, it was an, I mean, I think I heard the question and I've, uh, I've waited a long time to get a full toss that I can hit over the boundary to use a cricketing expression, which is probably lost on most in the audience. But anyway, sorry about that. Any more hands? <laughs> I have questions, of course. <laughs> I'm mm. <prepared>. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a question for Mr. Ma ying uh, Mr. Li Kuan Yu, in 2011, he had an interview with uh, Harvard University professor Graham Allen, Allison, and he was asked, whether China could become a democratic country. And Mr. Lee said no, without hesitation. Because if it becomes a free and uh, democratic country, it will collapse, that's what he said. And it's not possible for other countries to impose the standards on Ch the Chinese mainland and ask Chinese mainland to act uh, according to their democratic system because China has its own deep-rooted historical tradition. And so when, he, when, he, when it comes to democracy in the United States, Mr. Lee has his reservations, of course, he has got his own thinking. And we know that Taiwan society is proud of its political democracy, and including the Ma Ying Zhou Foundation is making a lot of efforts to promote exchange between the students, between the both sides of the Taiwan Straits. Do you think the young people on both sides of the streets can have a deep understanding of each other in terms of political and social systems. And what are the possibilities for the two sides to connect? What are the possibilities? How they can connect? And can the Taiwanese students accept the, the impossibility of uh, direct election in the Chinese mainland? This is not an easy question to answer. Uh, you want the Chinese mainland to become a democratic society. You need a lot of effort and it takes a long time and it may not be successful. However, I feel that the mainland Chinese, they do want uh, freedom and democracy. When our young people go to the mainland, when they have exchange with them, they can feel that. Because uh, China is really big, too big. You want to have a big change, you can't have it in the short term. Because I'm not saying, but I'm not saying that it's impossible forever. Because people like peace and yearn for uh, and freedom. So as we go along, I think this possibility is even greater. The issue of China's long-term position in the world. It's very important when you think about the relationship between China and the United States. 
that we avoid the mistake of becoming mesmerised by China's power. I think we are less mesmerised now, despite the authoritarianism of Xi Jinping, compared with his predecessors, than used to be the case. I think there's a greater understanding that um, uh, China has a big demographic problem. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, this is something that is full of metaphors, but it will be decades before there's any change at all. And the trend is very clear that China will um, age before she grows rich. And the demographic problems that she faces compared with nations such as Japan are very, very stark. I think only a few years ago this was not as apparent as it is now. And I think it is something that is both reassuring but also threatening because if people feel, nations, leaders feel that their position is challenged and is more vulnerable than was once assumed, they're more likely to do provocative things and to react rationally. That is why uh, it is enormously important that the, the gains we have made towards a more stable world and a more stable region and a pragmatic understanding and uh, a relationship between China and the United States that is not full of window dressing and point scoring, but is just a pragmatic inching towards uh, a better understanding is clearly the right way to go. I, I think I would agree with what Mr. Howard just said, that, which is that um, you know, we are talking about Mr. Lee and Mr. Lee's views about how countries interact with one another. I think he has been very clear that it is sometimes countries seek to make another country in their own image. But every country will have its own history, culture and development. And that many of these good ideas, as uh, Mr. Ma said, you know, if you think that that's the best, it, it will take time. Because it is a contest of ideas, right? If it's really indeed a much better system, a much better way. So I think, in fact, there's something which I would think that the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy is uh, constantly grappling with, which is what is the system of governance that will be best for that country at that particular point in time? Because even though uh, the, each country has this there are certain, you know, even if you look at, say, democracy and how it is practiced in different places, uh, there are significant differences. There are significant differences in which ways in which the government is formed, uh, in the way in which different policy uh, mm. uh, initiatives are mediated, uh, are presented to the electorate, and so on. So I think in the face of all these major challenges that are around us, I think there is room for us to look at different ways in which different governance systems can best serve their people. I think what we need to focus on in terms of country-to-country -country relations is that where is the common space for which we can work together and advance together and not to make a clone of another country because imposing our values and our system of doing things on another uh, may just be the factor that causes more discord and reduces the space for cooperation. Of course, we don't have a simple answer to that. But in the, in the uh, recent times when I was interacting with the young people in China, because they, they are really yearning for more, uh, the same, same amount of freedom and democracy, uh, same as us. Uh, I, I think it's not an absolute no as far as this goes, but it needs time for it to evolve and come about. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to ask questions. I'm Yong Hong from Singapore Lian Hai Zao Bao. Um, yeah. I've been, I have this question in my mind that I've been asking quite a lot of um, participants today, so I take the opportunity to ask the panelists, especially Minister Hing. Um, so, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew is a visionary, 
a leader, and he accurately predicted China's rise during Wenge or just right after Wenge, which is very remarkable. And then he spoke a lot about international affairs and issues. And now, like he's away from he's away for quite a few years, and with the state of the situation in the world now, with the state of U.S.-China relations and China, uh, what are some of the things that you think still falls within his prediction? And what are those that actually uh, he mispredicted? Yeah, that's, that's the question. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> yeah. the, I, well, I, I would say that uh, the... I think his view about the China's rise and progress, I don't think it has, uh, it has been uh, misplaced. Because I think when he... Uh, <coughs> let me just share an episode. When we were doing... When uh, Mr. Lee embarked on the Suzhou Industrial Park project, in fact, uh, internally within our uh, public service, there were some officials who were very concerned about China's... Uh, about accelerating China's growth because they say, well, this is going to create a lot of competition for Singapore. And is it wise for us to do that? And Mr. Lee's view is that, well, whether you do it or not, China will continue to make progress because if you look at the results of the reform and opening up, you just can't hold down a people that, uh, and they would want to make progress, they want to make uh, changes. So it is better for us to use this time to better understand what is happening. And then we ourselves have to make adjustments and to make progress. So I, I think the fact that he, he has been very clear that countries around the world must all seek, must all want to seek a better life. And political leaders around the world will promise their electorate that you elect me and your life will be better. I think that that is present in every election around the world. And whether, even if we have, don't have elections, countries, many governments' legitimacy rests on whether is life better for our people at the end of the day. So, so that, what that means is that the adjustments will need to be made by all countries, uh, big or small. And in fact, the smaller you are, like Singapore, the harder you have to work at making those adjustments. Because every little uh, change around the world has a big effect on us. Now, the other thing which I think he has, his, his view has probably have not changed, is that it is possible for America and China and, in fact, countries around the world to coexist peacefully. And what is important is for each to look for what are the areas of common interest. And even as you compete, you need to look for areas in which you can collaborate. So I don't think it is... I, his view has always been that it's not... A, a zero-sum game. And one reason, I think, why he had that view is that we must remember that he, in his uh, youth, he went through a very tumultuous period in global history that uh, he himself wrote in his memoirs that uh, he went through, he had to sing four different national anthems you know, as, as a young person, from God Save the Queen to... Uh, to the Japanese national anthem to you know, when we were merged with Malaysia and then the Singapore national anthem. So the, there will be all of these uh, major changes, but at the end of the day, uh, war has not resolved uh, issues. And uh, as I mentioned about Professor Graham Allison even earlier, in fact, Professor Graham Allison did a very extensive interview with uh, Mr. Lee uh, before he wrote the book. And uh, I, when I chatted with him, he said, actually, many of the views of Mr. Lee during the interview are still uh, very relevant. And I thought it may be some, it may, for those of you who are very interested, you can read uh, his interview with uh, Mr. Lee, which he recorded in great detail. So I think in terms of global uh, uh, relations and the importance of global peace and development for all countries, particularly for a small country like Singapore, that for all of us to grow and develop, you need a broad, broader, peaceful global environment in which cooperation is the norm uh, rather than contest. But it's also very clear that, of course, countries are going to uh, have major contests. Competition is a part of 
relations between countries. The bigger country wanting a bigger say is also a reality that we have to accept. And the question is, how do you craft global norms for which everyone can abide by, for which it is in the long-term interest of all involved? I don't know whether... Uh, anything to add? Mm. I'm from Mangjiang, I'm from Shang, uh, Hong Kong City University. I admire uh, Mr. Mang Yijou. So I want to ask you an academic question from an international law perspective, how you look at the position of Taiwan, because Taiwan is a some people say Taiwan is a part of China, and some people say Ch Taiwan is independent. Some people say that there is, it is, there are other kind of um, say. So, from an international law perspective, how do you look at Taiwan's position? Earlier, you talk about the positioning of Taiwan. Was this your question? Is this part of China? Or if uh, Taiwan is independent, there are three three descriptions of Taiwan. From my point of view as an international legalist, I think that Taiwan's position is already confirmed. This, If this question existed, it was because after Second World War, Taiwan had a uh, uh, some changes because mainland China felt that Taiwan belongs to us. Taiwan felt that mainland China belongs to us. Isn't this position clear enough? It's not indeterminate. It is quite clear. So there were some conflicts, but later on we embarked, we signed the 1992 consensus. So we sought to seek some common ground between us. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Jillian. I wonder if I may pose a question to DPM Heng, please. If um, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was still around, um, what would he say to us about the continuing value of ASEAN? We, uh, you mentioned just now that we all accept that uh, a broad global peaceful environment is good for everyone, and all countries desire that. But bringing that closer to the region that we exist, um, would his view or your take on his view be that the commitment is there among our Southeast Asian neighbours and what are then the trade-offs that may need to be made uh, in order to uh, hang together more tightly and ensure that we continue to be a peaceful environment within the Southeast uh, Asian uh, yeah. patch of the world in the midst of this uh, great power rivalry. Thank you, DPN. Yeah, thanks, Jillian. I, I, I'm not sure that I will be able to answer what would have Mr. Lee thought today if he was uh, alive. Uh, it's a very hard question. All that I can say is that if I were to extrapolate from what he had been doing, the first, right from the beginning, you know, right from the Singapore's independence, Mr. Lee believed in uh, cooperation with all countries, big or small. That, uh, and that is why we have always been, since independence, been a very strong proponent of multilateralism uh, in recognising the United Nations and in recognising the global rules that govern many of our interactions with other countries, including, for example, our separation agreement with Malaysia. It is lodged in the United Nations. So I think the rule of, the, rule of law and the global rule of law is something which he would... Uh, strongly advocate. I also mentioned in my speech earlier that uh, what brought Singapore uh, space to develop was his excellent relations with our neighbours, in particular with uh, President Sohato. He had a remarkable uh, relationship with uh, President Sohato and uh, that period where Indonesia exercised you know, their great restraint but also important leadership position in keeping the place together is a very important aspect of it. Now, the, the, our founding leader who is most uh, involved in foreign affairs was of course our foreign minister, Mr. Raja Ratnam, and he was a very strong uh, proponent of uh, ASEAN 
cooperation and eventually uh, ASEAN integration. So I would say that uh, the results speak for themselves. In fact, when I was an official at the Ministry of Trade and Industry, I did many, many of the negotiations on the ASEAN Free Trade Agreement, ASEAN Economic Community. What impressed me most during that period was that the, among the uh, senior officials across the 10 ASEAN states, there was a very strong uh, commitment to growing ASEAN together. In fact, I, remember, I still remember one of my fellow permanent secretary, uh, they were saying, well, you know, when we negotiate the ASEAN Free Trade Agreement, let's be more ambitious. Why stop at this? Why don't we do that? And I remember telling him that, are you sure our ministers will not agree? And he said, doesn't matter. We as officials must present our views and let's go for the maximum. And it is for them, they have the, they have the prerogative to say no to what we have proposed. But if you, if you and I don't stretch the envelope and stretch our frontiers of development, then we are not going to uh, achieve the outcome that we think should be achieved. So I think over time, as uh, ASEAN members work more closely together, you'll find that we should build closer rapport and understanding among the ASEAN states. Now, if you ask whether has it achieved results, I would say, uh, indeed, one of the things which uh, Minister George Hill was very involved in when, we, when he was a trade and industry minister was our, his, his uh, effort to not only bring the ASEAN member states together to form the ASEAN economic community, but also to forge free trade agreements at the ASEAN level with many countries, including, I re recall, uh, you know, with uh, China, in the ASEAN-China Free Trade Agreement, and for which the 10 countries were then able to negotiate with China on what was then known as the Early Harvest Package. Now, China is a much bigger economy than ASEAN even then, and a much growing strongly in competitiveness. China doesn't want to uh, displace, it doesn't want to put down uh, ASEAN even as it grew. So how do we find a formula where both parties can grow and grow together? So I think ASEAN integration have actually strengthened every ASEAN member state, whether in trade, whether in economic development, or whether mm. in, in the political space. So I'm very glad to hear that you know, ASEAN member states making very clear statements about, for instance, that ASEAN will remain a neutral place to be able to interact with countries around the world, uh, whether it's with the US or with China. And I think that trusted neutrality, neutral position, where we welcome people to work closely together with us, but we don't take sides, uh, is an important aspect. And I think 10 member states doing it together is a lot more uh, powerful and more effective than the one or two member states uh, taking their own position. So I'm, I'm, I would say I'm optimistic that us, and I, was, I would urge that you know, ASEAN member states work more closely together. As to whether that will be Mr. Lee's view, I'm not sure that if I had submitted a document like that to him, whether he would pass a failure. <laughs> but uh, I would say that I'm just extrapolating largely from my observation of his interaction. And from the very start, how Singapore sought to be a friend of everyone. Because I think that that sense of unity to be able, and that willingness to define our common interests and enlarge our common space has been a very important part of Mr. Lee's thinking. DPM Hague. I just <clears throat> would simply add that Lee Kuan Yew's leadership of Singapore uh, after he held the nation together and developed is a a wonderful, in fact, the best example I can think of in my lifetime of how effective the nation state is in projecting power in relation to bilateral relations between countries. Lee Kuan Yew would never have been able to achieve what he did for Singapore, and Singapore would not have achieved what it did under his leadership if it had all been driven 
by the, if you like, the uh, parameters of ASEAN or any other grouping of countries. Now, ASEAN was a great block. I think it's been a positive story and I don't really disagree with mm. anything that the Deputy Prime Minister has said, but in the end, uh, without the drive of the nation state and its capacity through strong leadership to relate effectively with other countries, uh, the horizons that uh, were available would have been more limited. Earlier, the gentleman asked about the positioning of Taiwan. Allow me to add on to it. The reason why this has become a question in the international arena is because after the Korean War, the U.S. sent the Seventh Fleet to Taiwan and announced that Taiwan's position is not determined. It depends on the decision of the allied countries. But then in 1954, Taiwan and uh, Taiwan and sent the defense agreement and that was very clear after that agreement was signed we are part of the mainland Chinese territory I am very astounded that there are still people asking questions about opposition today this should be the last question thank you Guilin, for giving me the opportunity for the last question Robin Hu Tamasek my question is to uh, President Ma um, Singapore's former uh, foreign minister, George Yeo, was in Taiwan very recently, and he gave a lecture to which I believe you attended as well, in which he suggested that perhaps a way forward to enhance a more cohesive relations across straits would be to contemplate the possibility of a Chinese commonwealth, uh, perhaps as a first step, and ultimately leading to other options. That's the first question. Second question is on January 13 next year, there's going to be a presidential election in Taiwan. And according to every uh, polls that seem to have been published, uh, your party is seemingly languishing in the third position. And uh, do you see a path to victory uh, for the KMT? Second question. The third question is Taiwanese people uh, appear to believe in multiple polls for the presidential election that if the KMT and the People's Party uh, led by Mr. Ke wen uh, were to combine its forces by nominating just one single uh, presidential candidate going forward, then there is a clear path to victory. And your comment on that, please. Thank you. I don't quite get his question. He okay. said there are three questions. Uh, uh, the first question is on your comments on um, Mr. George Yeo's, Mr. George Yeo's speech recently in Taiwan. Uh, Yang Rongwen Xinsheng said this bond. Because Mr. George Yeo talked about the Chinese Federation, uh, or rather Commonwealth, and the second question was the elections, presidential elections in Taiwan next year. Do you think that? the KMT will have any success. And the third question was on whether or not uh, Ke Zhengwen might be able to be united with the other political parties to stand in that election. With the first question, it was the Chinese Commonwealth that was espoused by George Yeo. Actually, this question was not much discussed in Taiwan because many people don't understand how it could be formed. Because Mr. George Yeo mentioned this because Singapore is a member of the British Commonwealth. So when he raised this, uh, the it was very it was actually very natural for him to raise this, but many Taiwanese did not have a concept of this commonwealth, so they didn't discuss about this too much within the Taiwanese society. So very, my apologies for that. And second question would be whether or not KMT might possibly win in the presidential election next year, because based on the poll results so far, KMT does not seem very optimistic is in third place so far, so how do you view this? You shouldn't say that because, you know, it's still very far away. The elections are still a long way to... The third question is, is it, possi is it possible, as you say, there might be changes down the road, is it possible that uh, Ke Zhengwen or might, might join 
together with another person. I think they are all forming alliances, but uh, but we can continue to work hard on that front. So with the last questions being raised today, our session today has come to a close. Recently, as I was preparing for this summit today, it occurred to me that during the East Tang Dynasty, there was a general from China who went to Sichuan, and then he encountered this old man then who was almost 100 years old then. He has already witnessed Zhuge uh, Liang. So this Huang Wen general asked him, who can be compared against Zhuge Liang, who is from the Romance of the Three Kingdoms? And this old man said, when he was young, Zhuge Liang, who was a sage in his days, was he did things where nobody felt were extraordinary. Everybody thought it was natural what he did. But now that time has passed, a lot of time has passed, and now that Zhuge Liang was no longer around, everybody then felt that actually Zhuge Liang, where everything that he did then was very impactful. I feel that Singaporeans, when he was around, when Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was around, because I personally have vis interviewed him, I've followed his delegation overseas, I have interacted with him, we felt that Singapore is like that. It's just natural. You don't, you didn't have any special, you didn't think, have any special thoughts about it. But now, after some time have passed, after Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's passing, we have had time to look back at some of his policies. We have seen the world change and rethink some of the things that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew had said about some of his views about the world development back then, some of his analyses back then. Now, even if we were to replay or reread some of the writings that he has made or some of the uh, interviews that he has accepted during his later years, I think that many of his views even today are very applicable and inspiring inspirational. In fact, we feel that very deeply now because now in the global stage, we seem to lack someone like him. So we feel that very keenly today. Some people said that, you know, circumstances made Mr. Lee Kuan Yew who he was, but after circumstances made him, that hero, has all, that hero, that man himself has also made the circumstances what it was later. So what the circumstances will be like today and in future are determined by people like us. So I think that at least Singaporeans, we should try to continue the Singapore success story that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew has built. So the discussion we have today has come to an end. Thank you very much.